So welcome back. We are we will start in about uh, one minute. So get ready, full power for the talk of Professor Marcus. Okay. Stop, stop, just wait. <laughs> so it's our chance to have uh, Professor Marcus Alden uh, giving this lecture about uh, diagnos diagnostics for carbon-free combustion. Uh, Marcus Alden, uh, for me, is kind of a role model of uh, what a researcher, sh a researcher should be, meaning that he's uh, the best in his field. And uh, he's really uh, keen in uh, sharing his knowledge and uh, his passion to everyone. So please uh, help me in welcoming Professor Marcus. OK, uh, thanks a lot for the nice um, introduction and for the invitation. And, and you hear it? It seems to be uh, an echo, right? It's good. And especially coming to, to the uh, Komosny Institute Summer School, because uh, I, together with Hideaki, uh, were in charge of introducing this uh, in Komosny Institute 10 years ago. And, and it's very nice to see that it's still alive and, and really uh, having a, a good purpose. So now, optical diagnostics. Um, and uh, I've been to summer schools before, and, and there I had sort of, of uh, 16 hours to speak of diagnostics. Uh, this is a different structure, so I have to squeeze down quite a bit. Uh, and I hope to be able to, to cover this uh, since it's a summer school. I will give some um, general introduction, a little bit of background uh, about the diagnostic instrumentation, uh, spectroscopy, and then a little bit on... on um, ah. There. Uh, application in uh, ammonia flames, biomass, and also metal combustion, uh, how diagnostics can be made. And then in terms of laser diagnostics, I will focus on, on mainly laser-induced fluorescence. Uh, then the next lecture will be on uh, Raman spectroscopy and, and cars. Um, and also there will be in ammonia, biomass, and uh, I hope to have time also to cover a little bit of, of a practical application, uh, including uh, hydrogen uh, enrichment in gas turbines. So th this is uh, how I look at the combustion diagnostics. And uh, we can divide that into uh, probe methods, uh, which is also very important. Uh, and then we have the optical methods. And that's sort of the main purpose of this lecture. I will just have a couple of slides on, on uh, probe techniques. And there you can divide them into spectroscopic technique and non-spectroscopic. And in terms of, of um, non-spectroscopic, we have, for example, Schlieren, shadowgraphy, interferometry, uh, holographic interferometry, and LDV and PIV. Uh, so I will just briefly uh, show a little bit on, on, on Schlieren shadowgraphy. And then, uh, of course, we have the um, main part, which will be on laser spectroscopy, which can then be divided into incoherent and coherent technique, which I will come back to uh, later. So actually, what we have in, in our field, as far as I can see it, is a toolbox. Uh, we have uh, lasers, uh, we have detectors, and we have techniques. And all of these can be used and has been used for decades in fossil fuel combustion. But the same, more or less, toolbox can then be used for study ammonia combustion. We can use it for biocombustion, metal combustion, and also a lot of other applications, both inside energy and outside energy. For example, we have a, a group looking into a thermal runaway in batteries, uh, plasmas, catalysis, material synthesis, and uh, you can also use this for medical application ecology, uh, essentially using um, the same uh, toolbox. The same laser, the same detector, and even sometimes the same molecule to study uh, in the other areas. So uh, what are we interested in? Uh, we want to measure a lot of, of important parameters, uh, species concentration, uh, molecules, radicals, atoms, pressure, temperatures, velocities, characteristics of uh, particles, number densities and sizes, as well as uh, surface um, characteristics. Just uh, 
slide on, on probe techniques. I'm not at all an expert in this. Uh, but of course, you have advantages with the uh, probe technique. For example, a thermocouple is, is uh, relatively cheap, easy to use, uh, robust. Uh, it can give a quantity of result. You can question yourself how correct are these measurements. Uh, and a, a great advantage is uh, that uh, some of these, uh, for example, um, gas chromatography and, and mass spectrometry, they can measure larger molecules where we in the optical field might have a problem to distinguish different polyaromatic hydrocarbons. Uh, and then you have uh, disadvantages. Uh, it's intrusive to a certain degree. Uh, it might be difficult to, to estimate how much error do we introduce by, by uh, having the probe. Uh, many techniques, most of them cannot easily measure atoms or radicals because they, they react in the probe. And uh, it's often an unclear, I would say, temporal and spatial resolution. Uh, and here are, are some just uh, disturbances when you use a probe. Uh, this is from a, a very nice reference, Manuel Hater. Uh, it's pretty old, but still you can read about all the, the possible uh, effects that you can have when you ha have a probe uh, in combustion. And then we, we slightly go into the optical techniques. Uh, the main advantage is, of course, that they are uh, non-intrusive, as you will see to a first approximation. Uh, some of the techniques we can measure in many points at the same time, simultaneously. And uh, some of the techniques, uh, not necessarily laser techniques, are simple. Uh, disadvantage, well, many of them are expensive if we have want to have the huge laser detectors, uh, uh, the equipment is uh, complicated, and also in some, some cases the theory to analyze the spectra uh, is not that easy. And some of the technique may have difficulties to actually give uh, quantitative data. It's not that e difficult to get a signal, but if you want to convert the signal to absolute number densities, uh, you might have to work a little bit harder. A uh, little bit on, on the non-spectroscopic opti optical techniques. Uh, uh, we have the uh, technique based on refractive index. Uh, and then we have LDV and PIV. I will not mention about these because these are commercial available. Uh, here is a sketch on, on uh, refractive index technique where you have um, uh, the light coming in then it's, it's refracted uh, in the measurement area, and then you can measure with shadow graphy, uh, you can measure with Schlieren, and you can measure the phase uh, with interferometry. And this is uh, a very applicable techniques, and, and we have seen that before. It, it's an easy setup. Uh, you have some kind of light source up here, and then you shine that uh, through the area of interest and then you detect it with a camera, and, and these are just some examples from the web where you can see uh, how it can be used to get a, a qualitative uh, image of what is going. And you can use, of course, pulsed uh, excitation, so you can even uh, follow very fast uh, events. Then the uh, uh, equipment. Uh, that we use for optical diagnostics. Very often we're using a light source, uh, which could be a lamp. Uh, most often, uh, at least in our case, we use laser or laser system. Um, and then we illuminate uh, the area of interest or, or we can measure the absorption. And then we have to use a lot of, of uh, optics, lenses, polarizers, filters, uh, mirrors. Uh, and then you detect through a spectrometer and with uh, uh, detectors. I will come back a little bit on these for those of you who are not uh, really into this uh, area. So here you can see some of the optics that we use. Uh, for example, uh, lenses, spherical lenses, cylindrical lenses, and uh, special uh, items. For example, dichroic mirror. Uh, that means that if you have 
which you might have if you have a YEG laser, which is an infrared laser at 106 nanometer. You want to, to use that to double to 532 nanometer, and then you want to separate the two beams. Then you will have a, a special uh, device called a dichroic mirror, which sort of splits the 532 and 106. Another example, if, if you do coarse experiments, you want to combine maybe a red beam and a green beam, and that could also be done with special uh, dichroic mirrors. And it's also important to have uh, many times uh, interference filters that are specially designed filters which sort of isolate spectrally the light you want to detect. So you can, can uh, decide to what center wavelength you want and the full width half max of this uh, interference filter. So that's something which is uh, very common to use. Uh, then, uh, in order to, to look at the different wavelengths, uh, we use a spectrograph or a monochromator. So this is a box like this. Uh, you have an entrance slit uh, where the, the light comes from the region you want to, uh, to um, look at, goes into a, a mirror, make it parallel and hit a grating, uh, which sort of separates the different wavelengths. So out on the plane of the exit slit, you'll get a spectrum. If you have white light coming into the entrance, you will get a, a sort of a, a rainbow uh, spectrum coming here. And that's uh, where you can put your detector, uh, which could be a CCD detector or a photomultiplier. So this is an important when we want to detect the different wavelengths. And uh, as detectors, uh, uh, the most sensitive is a photomultiplier. And uh, here you have incident light coming to a photocathode, uh, generate photoelectrons that heat different dynodes to accelerate so that you will get uh, a lot of sort of, of uh, photoelectrons uh, so you can detect very, very tiny amount of light. And this is very, very nice when you want to have the highest sensitivity, but it only measures in one point. Um, but you can, can get the time-resolved uh, measurements. And the most popular nowadays is the uh, intensified charge couple device, ICCD, where you have a CCD detector, somewhat similar to what you have in, in your um, uh, camera. But here we put a sort of a, a multi-channel plate uh, in front of the camera. Here you can see a setup, you have the lens. We have the um, yeah, multi-channel plate, and here is the detector. And the uh, multi-channel plate serves essentially as a photomultiplier so that in each channel uh, you have photoelectrons that generates more photoelectrons. And uh, there are different purposes why we use this um, uh, image intensifier. Uh, you intensify the signal. That doesn't mean necessarily that it's more sensitive than an ICCD, than a CCD, because it also produces uh, noise. But it's very important uh, when you work in combustion to have a time gate. You want to isolate in time. If you have a nanosecond pulse, you want to see the result from this laser during this time. Uh, if you're looking in a very, very uh, illuminous flame like a we uh, welding torch, you don't want to swamp the detector with a lot of background. And that's why it's important to have this multi-channel plate to sort of as a time gate the only look when you have your signal. And also, uh, a normal CCD is not UV sensitive. Uh, but with the multi-channel the, uh, multi plate, uh, you can also look in the ultraviolet. That's, I would say, the time gate and the, the uh, uh, to enlarge the wavelength region is the main reason, or the main reasons. So then we, we come into, uh, which I've seen as, as maybe the most challenging uh, part, uh, and that is the spectroscopy to understand uh, the spectra. And uh, in the, the uh, extended course, I mean, we have several lectures on the spectroscopy, trying to understand why we'll get a certain spectra. And uh, if you look at, for example, an atom, you have an atom, and then you have a, a, an electron, surrounding that, and that gives rise, depending on, on uh, where and how wide the, the path is for the electron, 
that give rise to electron levels, discrete electron levels. Uh, from molecules, it's a little bit different. Uh, here you have a co-nucleus and you have the um, electrons, but in the same way, depending on how the electrons fly around, it gives rise to different uh, electronic states. Ground state, down here, and an excited state. But now uh, we have a molecule uh, as compared to an um, atom. And that means that we also have vibrations. The two atoms can vib vibrate against each other and give rise to a fine structure both in the ground state, ground electronic state, and in the excited electronic state. Uh, and that introduces a new quantum number, V. But that's not uh, the whole story. We also have rotation, that the molecule can rotate. And that gives rise to a further uh, fine structure, so that for each vibrational level, you also have a rotational structure. And altogether, this gives rise to the spectra that we try to analyze. So um, here we can just see for OH, uh, it just looks like a lot of noise, but each line here is a transition or a line corresponding to, to a specific transition with a certain vibrational number and rotational number. And you get different branches depending on, on the selection rules. But it's not that difficult, really, to, to uh, analyze diatomic spectra. And uh, why do we do that? Well, one reason is to measure temperature. And then you can question yourself, how many molecules are distributed in the different energy levels? And that is given by the Boltzmann distribution. And here you have the vibrational population at different uh, vibrational levels. This is an example for, for nitrogen. And you can see that at low temperature, uh, most of them are in the uh, ground state. And then as the temperature increases, uh, you get population in the high vibrational states due to the uh, Boltzmann distribution. This is the vibrational energy. K is the, the Boltzmann constant, and T is the temperature. And in the same way, you have a distribution for each vibrational state. Uh, here you have uh, the quantum number J, uh, the degeneracy, and then you have the rotational constants, which is related to the inertia of motion of inertia. And there you have the sort of the, the constant for the molecule, uh, the weight and the uh, bond length. And then you have the Planck's constant, the speed of light, and the uh, constant. So this is how this spectra changed from 300 to 1000 K. So this is exactly what we are trying to use to measure temperature uh, with this spectroscopy. So this is just a summary. Uh, here up you have the population in the ground vibrational state and the rotational levels here. When you go to higher temperature, you see that this is decreasing, it's getting broader, and you also get population in the second um, vibrational state. And that is all in the ground state. And then you can just model this. Uh, these are called, by the way, uh, hot bands. And this because that appears when the, the situation is, is hot. Okay, so then we start with, uh, with um, uh, emission. And then the, the most uh, straightforward is to look at, at the black body radiation, the Planck radiation. Uh, that's sort of, of uh, for example, soot emit Planck radiation. And uh, this is given by, by this formula here. You have the Planck constant, you have the wavelength wavelength, the Boltzmann constant, and, and the emissivity. So how that changes uh, from 2000 to 3000 uh, Kelvin. And here is roughly where the eye can see between 400 and maybe 700 nanometers. 
so uh, that has been used uh, quite extensively uh, to measure uh, the temperature of, of uh, burning uh, particles. Uh, and then you can use what is called two-color perometry, where you just uh, detect the intensity at two different wavelengths, use the formula, and then you can get the temperature uh, like this. So it's pretty simple. That has been used for, for a long time. Uh, but we are not, in this meeting, interested in, in, in soot particle, right? We're not interested in, in uh, uh, fossil fuel. Uh, we, but we might still be interested in, in particles. And uh, there has been a growing interest in metal combustion. Uh, and for example, uh, I would say that Jeff Burgess, Burgesson uh, introduced a very nice paper not too long ago uh, where he showed that this can actually be used uh, as a uh, new fuel. Previously, metals ha had been used uh, more in, in, in um, propulsion and, and maybe uh, uh, in the space. Uh, but there are very interesting features. And, and uh, after his paper, there has been an innovation center created in, in Eindhoven, Metalot. Uh, it's a research center based in Darmstadt, Twin Circle, and we have been working with this for a couple of years. And, and I think this is quite interesting because uh, when you convert these particles, it's essentially free of carbon dioxide during the combustion. Uh, these fuels have a very high energy density, uh, larger than the, for example, diesel and gasoline. Uh, it's simple to store, transport. Uh, these fuels are abundant in the earth crust. And maybe most importantly, these particles can be regenerated using renewable electricity and used. And now just to, to illustrate this, for example, if we have the metals, we burn it, and then we, we take advantage of, of the heat and power for whatever we need. Then we get uh, particles, metal oxides, uh, that we take care of, and that goes into uh, metal reduction. And there, of course, we have to have uh, green energy, uh, when available, uh, sun and wind, and then we get the pure metals, and then we can start all over again. So this is a way to sort of, of uh, have an energy storage and an energy carrier. Uh, it has been a lot of, of, of interest in this, um, and of course the, the, we don't have all the, the solutions, uh, but it, I think it, it's very promising. Um, and especially as a diagnostic people, uh, now we, we want to see what happened with the burning particles. Uh, we want to have a high spatial result diagnostics, maybe on or close to the, these uh, particles, different uh, temperatures, species concentration. We want to do this in, in not only a point, we want to do it in 2D and 3D. Uh, there are a lot of, of uh, new species and for a laser diagnostician, that's very interesting to sort of not only look at OH or NO, but also, for example, FEO, LAU, LAOH, and so on. And uh, there we have to investigate how does the spectroscopy look like for these species. Then when we have a lot of, of um, um, particles, we, have, we might have multiple scattering. How do we handle multiple scattering? Well, we can handle it as we do in sprays uh, with different techniques. Uh, if you have a high laser, uh, you might introduce laser-induced breakdown, and then you can't do any measurements, uh, or the kind you want. Uh, you want to look at the, the particle morphology and the temporal evolution. And as I said, we have started to look into this, uh, and this is the setup for one of the experiments. We have a special burner uh, where we sort of seed, in this case, uh, iron particles, and we have two uh, high-speed uh, cameras and also a spectrograph. And the ambition was to sort of see by the Planck radiation uh, what happened when we have these particles. And we can see that uh, here in the high speed, how the particle comes in 
and uh, some of them, because of internal pressure, just explode. Uh, so that will be a challenge for our bottlers to, to sort of really see what happens and why does it happen. Uh, and then since we had the, the two cameras we can uh, look at in 3D, and we can also sort of, of uh, rotate and see. So these are very important input for the modelers, and, and also especially maybe the temperature measured, as I th said before. So we can measure the temperature of the burning particles that goes into the, the uh, modeling. Uh, we have also looked into a, a technique based on, on digital inline holography uh, to actually measure the, the particle size, 3D location and velocity. So in this case, it's a C, CW laser. Uh, the beam is shaped up with spatial filter, uh, collimated and, and sent through the uh, burning particles. And then we have a high speed camera. And when evaluating these holograms, we can sort of, of deduce the uh, particle diameter also in the fed direction. So we get a, a spatial resolution. Uh, so far, most of the work has been concentrated on, on iron. Uh, but I think uh, there are certain advantages with uh, aluminum. Aluminum has a uh, uh, protection layer. It's safe. Uh, you can, can store it for a very long time. Uh, it's at a high energy density, uh, if I remember correct, almost double that of, of iron and, and uh, gasoline and uh, diesel. And what is very interesting is that uh, if we have the alumina particles react with water, you can produce hydrogen uh, and you can produce it on demand in time and space. And that's something which uh, has been of, of great interest, for example, for uh, gas turbine manufacturers, if they want to, to have a gas turbine and not having the infrastructure of gas turb of uh, hydrogen, maybe this could be a small device that could produce hydrogen. And another uh, interesting, which we really don't know, but that, that is you have a lot of scrap aluminum, which is more or less used for landfill, but it's still very energetic. So we have... Uh, <laughs> Not evidence, but indications that maybe this can be used as a fuel, even if you have a sort of the, the it's a bad aluminum with a lot of silicon. That's something which we are interested in, and, and this is something uh, that we have done just a couple of weeks ago, where we have a small wire, wire of uh, aluminum, put that in, into a... Uh, burner or after where you have hot uh, water. And this is, um, here is the wire before. I hope I can sort of start the movie. So there you see that, that uh, you create a droplet that is burning. And uh, this is essentially uh, how it looks like. The aluminum oxide the alumina goes into an oxide cap, which you can see here, because it has a higher uh, emissivity. And then you have the uh, alumina burning uh, as a droplet. So, I mean, you could see this as, as more, almost uh, uh, liquid droplet burning, like, like uh, diesel or, or something like that. So this might be something that could be of, of great interest in the future. But there are, I don't want to oversell this. I mean, there are a lot of, of, of challenges, both in terms of modeling and in terms of, of uh, diagnostics. But it's a it's very nice area, uh, an interesting area with a lot, lot of challenges. Uh, then we have heard already about the chemiluminescence. That's when, uh, as was indicated before lunch, uh, species are created in the excited state. Uh, here you can see a Bunsen burner with, with uh, propane. And uh, this could be a very nice, as was demonstrated before, tool. But you also have to be aware of that it's a line of sight technique. Uh, so you don't have any spatial resolution in the field of view. And it's also difficult, uh, for example, if you have a certain signal from CH or C2 to uh, make absolute number densities out from the 
uh, emission itself. And then, as you also have seen before, uh, this can be done in, in ammonia. This is uh, uh, in the UV, and we have been looking a little bit more into um, the visible. So here are our two examples. Uh, that's a lean flame, uh, where the blue indicate uh, NO2, the uh, red in indicate NH2, and then if you have a rich flame, uh, everything is, is uh, NH2. And that also gave a, a possibility to sort of, of uh, deduce the uh, equivalent ratio by looking into this, if you are aware of that it's a line of sight technique. Okay, now a little bit of, of biomass, um, and that can also be, be uh, of great interest to look at uh, the emission. So here we, we have a, a lot of, of, of small bioparticles, uh, roughly 200, 300 microns, uh, seeded into a flame, and uh, we analyze this uh, both with a spectrometer to see how the spectra look like, and to, to look at the, um, how the, put, put, uh, the particle burns. So these are, are uh, just some examples. Uh, one filter is, is uh, centered around 430 to look at the CH. Uh, one around 590 where the sodium is emitting. And in the infrared 765 where the potassium emits and some other filters. And then we can look at the different stages and the different filters during the combustion, the volatilization stage, and also during the star oxidation uh, stage. And you can uh, take a lot of, of um, uh, see a lot of, of things happens, uh, which are the strongest emitters. Uh, C2 and the CH uh, indicate the reaction zone. And uh, this is sort of helping out to understand biomass uh, combustion. Of course, you can also look at, at the uh, emission from uh, this um, uh, flames with uh, particles, uh, metals. This is uh, for the iron. You can see, recognize the uh, spectra around uh, 500 something nanometers, a little bit depending on what kind of, of uh, environment uh, you have. So these are our emission spectra when we had uh, iron particles on the order of 80 uh, micron. And then uh, in the same way, uh, if we see aluminum particles, uh, we see LAU bands with, with high and low uh, oxygen. But this is, uh, I, I would say that, that at least for us, this is we are just in the beginning of investigating this. Uh, uh, you can see the, the simulation and the experiments. It's not perfect. Uh, uh, do we really have local equilibrium? Uh, we haven't taken an, into account self-absorption. Uh, we might have interfering species, interfering background, thermal background. Uh, so this is something that, that uh, we have to work a little bit harder to, to really understand. And then there is also emission in the infrared. Uh, so far, most of the work has been uh, done in, in the visible or ultraviolet. But of course, I mean, you can look at the infrared molecular emission. And there, uh, you have a lot of, of bands from water and carbon dioxide. So when you do experiments in, in the uh, infrared, you have to be aware of that you, uh, where you have your sort of water and carbon dioxide bands. I haven't seen anyone looking into ammonia flames, so this is the hydrocarbon flame. Okay, uh, absorption. Uh, I won't say too much, but that's of course a, a very important technique and has been used extensively. Uh, this is, I mean, you, you send in laser beam at the correct wavelength and, and just the, take the transmission and then you use the Bear Lambert's law, and then you can deduce the concentration of the species. But also here, I mean, you have to watch up. This is a line of sight technique. So uh, when you have an environment where the species you are interested in change in time and space, 
then you might have a problem because you can't easily, you can't <laughs> average sort of the Boltzmann distribution. You can't take a spectra at 1000K, one spectra at 2000K, put them together and say that this will give 1500K. So you have to be very careful when you, you sort of have a, a, not a, a constant temperature and um, concentration. On the other hand, you, you, you get with this technique uh, quantitative information, and that is very important. You can get absolute number densities. And uh, when you do the um, absorption, I mean, uh, we have looked into to, uh, absorption cross-sections, uh, uh, then we realized we need a, a good burner, and uh, we've been weighing in our lab, uh, together with Xu Sang Li, put together what, what uh, we call a multi-jet burner. So here you have uh, the chamber where you have the fuel. It could be ammonia, it could be methane uh, air that goes into these jet tubes that produces a lot of, of, of um, small flames. And then you have the, the cold flow chamber where you can sort of add and dilute the flame. And that means that, that uh, what we have is a very homogeneous, very stable 1D flame environment where we can vary the temperature uh, almost between 1000 and 2000 K. And that is exactly what we need if we want to uh, measure, estimate the um, absorption cross sections. Uh, and this is just a couple of experiments. Uh, uh, we want to see the uh, absorption cross section of ammonia in the ultraviolet. Uh, since in the infrared, uh, you might have problems with interferences from uh, water. So this is a setup uh, with, um, at low temperature uh, and where we have a heated cell that could go up to 590K. And the detection limit here is, was on the order of, of 10 ppb. The cell length was 20 centimeter and uh, 295 Kelvin. And then we use the multi-jet burner, as described before, uh, to go to high temperature, to get the absorption cross-section at high temperature. In this case, the detection limit was on the order of 200 ppm. And this uh, was then used to uh, measure uh, in the wavelength region of 200 to 230 nanometers the absorption cross-section uh, from room temperature up to 15K, uh, 70 Kelvin. We also model this, I'm sorry, uh, model this and it was a good agreement. Uh, so here is in a lean flame uh, where we measured NO, and then uh, in this case, in a rich flame, uh, ammonia, and then it was possible to get the, the concentration in this 1D flame of both NO and ammonia uh, at different equivalent ratio. Uh, I said that uh, bio, uh, in Sweden at least, uh, biocombustion is, is very important. We have a lot of, of wood. Uh, but we have a problem with the potassium compounds. Uh, they, as you can, can see here, uh, they contribute to fouling, corrosion, and slagging. And uh, the most abundant uh, potassium-containing species are KOH and KCL. And uh, there were no really absorption cross-section found. Uh, so we used, once again, the, the, uh, this uh, multi-jet burner and measured the uh, absorption cross-section for between roughly 1,300 and 1,800 uh, for KCL and uh, KOH. That, that's important uh, when we want to measure these species and also to compare with, with uh, modeling. Of course, it, it's also possible to use um, a diode laser uh, to measure the potassium atom. And this is uh, wood and this is straw measurements uh, as a function of time. Uh, and we can sort of add, measure that. Uh, then this is in the PPB level and, and the diode laser is on the order of 770 nanometer. 
Uh, I will show only one uh, example from, from the real infrared and, and uh, just exemplify for measurements of HCl, which is also a compound which might be, be produced in, in biomass. So this is uh, using the uh, high trend, the high temp, where we have um, the water lines. And you can see that you have water lines almost everywhere uh, at this temperature. And uh, you detect some of the HCl uh, hydrogen chloride lines uh, and find, after a lot of, of investigation, which line uh, could be used. And then in this burner, uh, we can then measure the uh, concentration of the uh, HCl using a diode laser, as shown here, where the, the, we can have a multi-pass in the multi-jet burner. Okay, so that was sort of a little bit of the background. Now into to, uh, laser diagnostics, uh, the wonder of laser diagnostics. And you might ask, uh, why are we interested in laser diagnostics? Well, uh, you have certain advantages. First of all, at least to the first approximation, it's non-intrusive. I will come back to this later. Uh, you focus the beam to a very small spot. Uh, that gives you the, the spatial resolution. By the way, here is how it could like look uh, if you introduce a probe. So you can clearly see that, that you influence uh, the flame just by introducing a probe. Uh, so you get a high spatial resolution. Uh, you have high temporal resolution. We use uh, pulse laser with a pulse length on the order of nanoseconds or, or shorter. Uh, many of the techniques are species specific. Uh, they are multiplex, meaning that, that uh, we can measure several species and in many points at the same time. And you can go to more or less any temperature, um, even non-equilibrium uh, temperatures. Uh, so the parameters, you can measure rotational temperature, vibrational temperature, electron temperature. Uh, we measure species concentration of atoms, radicals, molecules, uh, velocities, characteristics of particles and surfaces, and also two-phase uh, characteristics. Then, of course, I have to be honest. I mean, uh, there are certain disadvantages. As I indicated, uh, many of the techniques are pretty complicated. Uh, many of the, the equipment could be very expensive. Uh, you have to watch out for A-safety. Uh, Many of these lasers are pulsed with an extremely high pulse energy. You don't want to get even a small portion of that into your eye. Uh, but you need an optical access. You need a window into your, your combustion environment. And then uh, I said that it's non-intrusive. That's, as I will indicate later, uh, you have to, to really watch up when you use these high power lasers not to, to cause any problems. I mean, you can have a laser, laser induced breakdown. You create a, a, a plasma. And of course, that could be a technique in itself and has been used. But if you want to use this in laser induced fluorescence, Raman, or whatever, then you have a problem. Uh, and you can create molecular fragments uh, if you're not careful. And you can have also have optical, optical pumping between the levels of the uh, molecule you're interested. So this is uh, how I have seen the uh, laser diagnostics in, in combustion. Uh, uh, I've, we've been working in, in sort of three different levels. Uh, at the bottom here, we look at generic activities. And with that, I really mean uh, light matter, matter interaction. We really dig into the spectroscopy, try to develop new technique. There's really nothing with combustion to do, but it's a background with that we have to know. We have to sort of face uh, new challenges without knowing whether we su will succeed or not. Uh, so here we, we sort of play around. Here it gets a little bit more serious. Here we work with uh, experts in other fields, C 
TFT, kinetics, heat transfer, because uh, I could speak for myself. I mean, I'm not an expert in, in either of these, but I can, we can help out together to solve problems. To study pollutant formation, fuel properties, turbulent reacting flow, high pressure phenomena, and combine the diagnostics with our colleagues uh, in chemistry and uh, CFD and heat transfer. And then, equally important, I would say, for our, our sort of all the, to have a good conscious, uh, because after all, we want this to sort of come out to the society, to industry, and really take the techniques developed, applied in the laboratory, also to the real device, to the engine, to the gas turbine, to the furnaces. And very often, when dealing with the industry, they, we, we get questions. Uh, can, can you measure that? Can you do that? And sometimes we sort of feed back that uh, question down here, and at least sometimes could come back after some development and face that specific problem. Okay, so here are, are an overview of, of the different techniques. Uh, as I said before, uh, we can divide them into incoherent and to coherent techniques. In the incoherent technique, we have a laser, focus that into the flame and detect more or less, uh, as much as possible, into a spectrograph and detector. And here we have a me Rayleigh scattering, uh, looking into particles, uh, also temperatures. Laser induced fluorescence, which I will come back to later. Laser induced incandescent to study soot. Laser induced phosphorescence, which can measure surface temperature. I will briefly mention that. And Raman scattering, uh, that Anna will, will mention about that later. And then we have the, the coherent technique based on non-inner optics, where we have uh, two or more laser beams, uh, cross them in the point of interest, and uh, from the crossing point, a new beam emerges, carrying information about the species concentration and temperature in the crossing point. And here we have, for example, cars, polarization spectroscopy, GNA for a mix, and based on youth grating spectroscopy and stimulated emission. So uh, I think, Gatano, you will cover cars a little bit, maybe. Uh, I will just very, very briefly mention about the uh, gen for mixing, uh, how that can be used. Okay, so uh, for the rest, I will more or less concentrate on laser induced fluorescence, and we've heard about that before. Essentially, what you do is that you have a laser, uh, tune that to a resonance of the species of interest. Excite the molecule uh, from the ground state to the excited state, and then after a short while, the species re-emit radiation, indicated by the red arrow here. And with this, we can measure a lot of, of um, species uh, of interest in combustion, NOOH, NH, NH2, CN, and so on. But then you can also extend that by two photon laser induced fluorescence, where you sort of put two pho photons on top of each other, so it, it uh, it's essentially works as, as a conventional technique where you can do a lot of, of, of uh, very nice work, although it's a nonlinear approach. And here, I mean, with this technique, you have a high sensitivity. You can do 2D and 3D imaging. Uh, you can do high-speed visualization. And the main problem is that uh, it's not that easy. It's easy to get signal. You can easily get an image. But how do you convert that signal to absolute number densities? Because not all of the excited species emit radiation. They lose their energy through collisions. And that is something that, that uh, we have tried to work uh, very hard to. And there are some, some techniques that I, I will describe. So here is the uh, signal for laser induced fluorescence in the linear regime. It's proportional to the number density, the laser intensity. And then you have the, what I call the fluorescence efficiency. And this is the Einstein A coefficient. Uh, and this is the quenching. And that's where the problem starts. Uh, how could we estimate the quenching? 
And to really make a, a quantitative measurement, you, you have to estimate the quenching. Uh, and that is depending on the pressure, the temperature, the composition. So it seems to be almost an unsolvable problem. But there are ways, and I will illustrate that, uh, you can estimate the constant major species and knowing the collision cross-sections. You can saturate the transition. You can measure the quenching by a picosecond laser uh, together with a street camera. And you can do in situ absorption measurements. And I will exemplify some of these. Uh, for example, well, first of all, you can also do uh, uh, temperature uh, measurements. There are different ways uh, illustrated in the book by, by Alan Eckbrett. Uh, you can sort of, of scan the laser to probe the ground state population um, that re would resemble uh, absorption spectra. Or you can use uh, one laser. Did it disappear? Yeah. You can use one laser to excite it in, into the excited state, and then you can hope that it thermalizes, and then you can look at the spectra from the emission to get the temperature. Or you can use a two line approach where you sort of, of uh, and this is the one that you have to do if you want to do temporary result measurements. You, you excite with two different wavelengths one from the ground state, one from the excited state, and there they will probe the ground and upper state population. So the ratio of these signals will give you the temperature through the Boltzmann distribution. So this is just uh, some old uh, excitation spectra of NO. This is in, in room temperature and this is in, in flame. And uh, you might think that this is just a lot of noise. But this is real molecular structure coming from calculating the spectra, uh, as I described before. It's not that, that difficult. Uh, there's been a lot of, of, of uh, temperature measurements uh, using OH, NO. Uh, we have looked into the possibility also to use uh, two-line atomic fluorescence, uh, which has certain advantages. Uh, because atoms have a much higher uh, transition probability. That means that, that we can use very low power, which is an advantage. Uh, instead of, of, of having a lot of power, we are doing experiments in the visible. Don't have to go down to the ultraviolet. Uh, and that means that we can do experiments uh, in very, very sooty flame, where sort of conventional laser induced fluorescence would have a problem. And then, of course, you have to be careful uh, uh, what you spe uh, see it in, but the, you have to look at the temperature sensitivity, uh, the spectrum, and that you're not influencing the, the uh, combustion process. But two species that have been used uh, is gallium and indium. So you see the very, very small amount into the flame. Uh, and then you, you probe. Uh, the ground state and the, in the fine structure, and then you can easily get the temperature from this formula, where the, you have the fluorescence intensity, you have the laser intensities, you have the wavelength, and the energy level, the energy uh, difference between the ground state and the excited state. So this is not uh, that complicated. I will come back to this uh, a little bit later. I guess you all know about the 2D measurements, uh, that you have a round beam, you focus that with a cylindrical lens, uh, send it into the beam, and you can get the 2D. That has been around now for, for 40 years. Um, but then there are species which are not that easy to detect with conventional laser-induced fluorescence. For example, hydrogen peroxide, HO2, uh, methyl radical, O3, and so on. There are a lot of, of species which are not easily, at least, accessible with laser-induced uh, fluorescence. So how could we possibly measure these? Well, you can turn a disadvantage. Uh, you have the, the photodissociation. If you deliberately uh, photodissociate the species and create something that you can measure, then you can turn this into an advantage. Of course, you have to, what I call, do controlled photodissociation. You have to know what you do. 
And then you have a couple of techniques uh, which we can call photofragmentation, basically induced fluorescence. That means that you create a molecule in the ground state, and then you have a second laser to probe that ground state. I will exemplify that. Or you can use laser induced photofragmentation fluorescence, where you, with your laser, create uh, a species in an excited state and look at the emission. And this turned out to be, be a, a very nice technique. And, and here is just an example how to measure uh, H2O2. So here we have two lasers, uh, one at 266, which sort of, of dissociate uh, H2O2 into two ground state OH. And you all know how to measure OH, right? I mean, you have a laser roughly at 282 to excite the um, OH molecule, and then you get the mission, which sort of, of uh, indicate where we have the hydrogen uh, peroxide. And this is just uh, the first demonstration. We have a bottle of, of uh, uh, hydrogen peroxide, mi which mixed with uh, water, and then through, through uh, three holes, and uh, argon pumping into this, and you can see sort of individual shots of hydrogen peroxide. And of course, you have to investigate that, that we, it's not OH coming from water that we see. So now uh, uh, I will focus a little bit on, on uh, how we can look into species in ammonia combustion. Uh, the, it's a lot of, of species which could be of interest. Uh, uh, OH, pretty straightforward. Excite in, in the ultraviolet, you get the spectra. NO, also you excite at around 26 nanometer, and you get the, the gamma bands. That, that's not that uh, complicated, it works. But then it's the question of how could you convert this to absolute number densities? As I said before, it's not that difficult to, to get an image. And then we saw that, that once again, you can turn a disadvantage into an advantage. If you have an uh, absorption along the laser beam, uh, that you might think is a problem. But the absorption can be used in situ to get the number densities. So if you have, in this case, uh, a laser tuned to the OH, and you have two beams going opposite each other, then you will get two images like this, one back, one forth. And why is, do you have absorption? Well, because you have OH. And if you go through the, the mathematics, uh, you come out that the number density is, I wouldn't say a simple, but I mean straightforward. You can just divide the, the um, intensities, take the logarithm, derivative, the cross section. And out comes the, the number density. You get rid of the quenching. So once again, you, you always can have problems, but many times often you can turn that into an advantage. And that then can uh, that be used as we'll uh, illustrate later on. And then you have, um, uh, if you look up, uh, you have a, um, how the, the uh, rate equation look like, then you can easily show that, that if you have a short laser, short laser pulse, the decay is actually the quenching constant. But that means that you have to have a laser which is short on the picosecond scale, and you have to have a street camera. And in the 80s when, when uh, we started, uh, that was not available. But nowadays, I mean, you can have picosecond lasers, you can have a street camera, and then you can actually measure the quenching. You measure the Q, and that helps you to convert. And this is in a, in a ammonia, uh, methane, uh, flame. This is uh, how the uh, decay looks like. And here we have the, the end of fluorescence lifetime, which is on the order of, of one and a half nanoseconds. And using that uh, can convert the number density into ppm. So now we have actually number densities. We don't just have a nice picture. Uh, and then we go to saturation, and then we go to NH. NH is, as we have heard, a very important species. 
Uh, this is the energy level diagram for, for NH. It's a triplet in the ground state uh, and, and excited state. You can sort of um, uh, excite either at uh, 302 or 333 nanometer. Uh, and then uh, we get an experimental spectra. This is an uh, excitation scan. Uh, this is the model. So I would say that here we understand uh, the spectroscopy. And we can also show that we saturate the transition. And when you saturate or almost saturate the transition, uh, the signal is independent on, on the laser intensity and uh, you don't have to care about the quenching. This is another technique how to convert signal into uh, number densities. So here are, are some um, uh, 2D spectra of NH, and, and uh, we concluded that uh, 2D signal shot with a three centimeter uh, sheet is on the order of 100 ppm. Then uh, we've seen this before. Uh, you can go on to, to measure NH2, uh, and that, that was already in the mid 80s uh, measured in the red at 30 nanometers by Copeland and co-workers, and, and we used the Alexandrite laser uh, at 386 nanometers. So this is the excitation spectra, and uh, we were able to model the spectra at room temperature, but we failed at high temperature just because there are no data for uh, combination band, hot band, at uh, flame temperature. So here is it possible to do 2D image, so in this case it's it's a nice picture, but it's not quantitative. And this is the emission uh, spectra. So the detection limit for 2D single shot, three centimeter sheet is on the order of 1000 uh, pp ppm. And then of course you, you want to measure ammonia itself. How could you measure ammonia? Well, you can uh, do it with Raman. I think Gaetano will, will mention about that, but you can also use laser induced fluorescence. But then you have to use a two photon step. You have to excite, for example, at, at uh, three or five nanometers from the ground state up to the sea state, and then you get emission around 565 nanometers. So this is an excitation scan. This is the um, emission spectra. So here I think we, we uh, understand the spectroscopy. Uh, uh, this is the experiments, this is the simulation. Uh, pretty good agreement. And that could be used also at high pressure. So this is at, at one bar, three bar, uh, five bar. And you could do imaging. This is uh, simultaneous imaging of ammonia and CH um, in a methane ammonia flame. You can see this is uh, more or less laminar flame, the ammonia and the CH. And this is a turbulent flame. Uh, however, the, the single shot detection limit uh, 800 ppm with a signal to noise at 1.5 is maybe not that uh, impressive. So that's why, why we looked into uh, could this uh, photofragmentation technique work also for, for uh, uh, ammonia? And that is not new. I mean, that was uh, demonstrated in the late uh, 90s. And here there are uh, two photons at 193 that create NH in the excited state. And then NH give rise to emission at 336 nanometers. So this is uh, experiments just trying to see that we understand. Uh, this is the uh, emission for NH around 336 at different temperatures. And uh, this is the experiment. This is the experiment, this is the simulation. So we, we thought that we, we understand what is going on. And it was also so uh, measured how this uh, intensity varies as a laser, uh, laser pulse energy was increased. And then uh, this was applied in a jet flame, as you can see up here. Uh, and the aim was to see uh, could we measure the slip ammonia in a rich flame? And uh, that was done with the, the uh, 
basis with photofragmentation technique. And, and here you can see the experiments, simulation. Uh, this is also temperature was uh, simulated. And this is just the emission from the NH2. So with this technique, uh, the flame detection limit for 2D single shot when you have a sheet on the order of 2.5 centimeter is on the order of 130 uh, ppm. Much better than the true photon uh, approach. Then I haven't mentioned anything about the, the uh, atoms. Uh, it's also of interest to measure hydrogen atom, oxygen atom, maybe nitrogen atom. And for that purpose, we have to use a two photon excitation scheme. And uh, we have been working with that since early 80s. And, and uh, using the nanosecond lasers, we had a problem because it's very easy to photo dissociate uh, some of uh, some species to create an atom. And how do we know that we are looking at the correct atom and not the photo dissociated? But that has been, been um, facilitated now with a femtosecond laser. Uh, which has a, a very high uh, peak power, but still uh, modest pulse energy. And then uh, it's possible to measure these species, uh, not yet nitrogen atom, uh, but these two and a colleague of mine have uh, used the femtosecond laser, uh, exciting both uh, hydrogen and oxygen atom at the same time with two different cameras. Uh, and here are single shots for oxygen and hydrogen uh, with the equivalent ratio ranging from 0.8 and uh, 1.3. And then, of course, I mean, to, to use this, uh, going to the next level to uh, work with modelers, uh, we try to, uh, to do whatever we can to, to get as good data as possible to feed into our colleagues looking into the chemistry. And here are, are some almost flat flames uh, where the NH and OH were measured by this back and forth uh, technique. Um, and NH, OH and NO with the back and forth and NH with the uh, saturation. And then we could compare with uh, different models uh, compared with our, our uh, basic uh, technique. So that's one example. Uh, another example, uh, working with uh, Su Song Bai, uh, who do the, the uh, LES or DNS in this case. And here it's a uh, uh, ammonia methane flame at three bar. And uh, this is uh, one bar for NH numerics experiments. This is three bar numerics and experiments. And this is three bar numerics and experiments for NO. And here is sort of the, the um, experiments and compared using different uh, 1D uh, chemical kinetic schemes uh, from various uh, groups. So I think that this is uh, the way that we can hopefully approach uh, commodity problems to, to really work together with, um, with the different disciplines. Well, you have seen this before also. I mean, uh, going to turbulent flames, highly turbulent flames. I don't need to spend too much time on this. Uh, and the aim was here to see uh, how the, spec the uh, flame would look like at high Colovitz number. This is the, the jet flame stabilized with a with flat on um, methane air flame. So here we have uh, two laser systems. Uh, we wanted to measure either NH or NO together with temperature, uh, with the uh, Rayleigh scattering. And um, these are at the highest Colvitz uh, number, NH and temperature, NO and temperature. And uh, there we want to see how would the sort of NH, NH layer uh, change when you go to a high Colvitz number. And you can see that uh, these are at different heights uh, that you get a substantial increase um, of the reaction zone or NH. And then, as was also shown before, I mean, we compared this with a distributed reaction zone a burner similar to the one that has been, been used uh, by Jim Driscoll uh, 
for uh, hydrocarbon flames. And uh, this was somewhat similar setup. Uh, here we also measured the uh, velocity, but the NH and, NH and OH were measured. So here is uh, at the highest um, Kolovitz number, different heights, NH and OH. And uh, here is the mean thickness of the NH layer at different Kolovitz number, and it's more or less independent on the call of its number. So here we have for the jet flame a broadening of, of the NH layer in three to four times. And for the other uh, uh, burner, we could see no broadening. And that was a little bit puzzling, uh, at least for the modelers. And, and as was also described uh, later, Xu Singbai and his group uh, took this on and uh, made larger the simulation and compare that with experiments at different Kolovitz number for the jet flame and for the distributed uh, reaction zone flame and, and uh, got quite nice uh, agreement. So that, that uh, the characterization of flame regimes is dependent on fuel and the burning length scale. And a broadening requires that the energy eddies have a size smaller than the laminar flame. Uh, there's been a lot of, of, of interest in, in uh, the distributed uh, reaction regime, and, and uh, we and others have worked quite intensively with hydrocarbon flames. So it was interesting to go to also look into uh, ammonia, uh, how that looked like. Okay, so now I'll switch gears a little bit and, and uh, go into um, uh, diagnostics related to combustion of, of solid biomass. Just to, to show the different uh, stages, here is the devolatilization stage. This is the short oxidation stage, and this is the ash cooking stage. And here, actually, you can see the laser, which in this case create a breakdown, um, which also can be used uh, as a diagnostic tool. And here we have a lot of, of uh, parameters uh, that we would like to measure, nitrogen-bound species, sulfur bound species, alkali bound, chlorine, as well as surface and gas, gas temperature. So it's a lot of, of uh, diagnostic challenges. Uh, just to start up with, with uh, gasification and, and pyrolysis, uh, you can do that in different ways. We have used uh, this is a single particle reactor where we can put a, a wood particle and then look uh, how the pyrolysis uh, take place, or we can use a high heated grid reactor where we can increase the temperature very fast. Just some, some examples uh, when putting uh, small pieces of, of wood into this um, uh, reactor, particular reactor. And then here we come to, I would say, maybe a, a problem with lazy diagnostics because we are seeing a lot of, of uh, this is the lift spectra uh, recorded at different uh, uh, temperatures with different uh, excitation wavelengths. And, and uh, you see spectra, uh, but you cannot easily say what kind of spectra. Uh, it's, it's polyaromatic hydrocarbons, but we can't say which kind of, of polyaromatic hydrocarbons. We can just say that uh, uh, the shift to higher wavelengths, then you have more rings. But it's not possible to at least not easily to distinguish between phenantry and anthracy and uh, pyrene and, and uh, the different um, pHs that might be. So this was just to, to, to look into the um, overall spectra of different uh, excitation. And also you can um, put uh, the um, wood particle and see where does the emission come physically. You just image the spectra, whatever it is. Uh, and then you can see that, that uh, it comes essentially from, from where you have the fiber aligned according to the, to the um, so here, for example, the, the particle is, is standing up and, and you get the emission from this. What is interesting is that, that uh, here, uh, with excitation at 355 nanometer, you start to see a little bit of structure. 
And uh, we investigated that with a heated grid reactor and, and uh, uh, we looked in a DME flame uh, where we know we have a formaldehyde and then we could compare with the spectra from the pyrolysis and we could really see that, that uh, clearly this corresponds to formaldehyde coming out from the uh, pyrolysis. And then we, we also measured that as a function of time. This is in the heated grid reactor. You can see that, that you uh, was heated in, this is just a one second that, that you heat it very fast. And it was also possible to measure CO uh, uh, time result. Still, this is just, just nice images. Here we, we didn't have any ambition to to quantify. Then uh, at the devolatilization stage, it's of interest to measure um, KOH and KCL. Uh, and how could you sort of distinguish that? Well, you can look into this uh, lazy induced photofragmentation technique. Uh, so this is investigation uh, with laser at uh, 266, 213, and 193. Uh, but I will concentrate on, on, for example, 266. You see that you have um, uh, quite a lot of, of KOH, a little bit of uh, KCL when you excite the 266. That's what you can see here also. With the 266, uh, you have quite a lot of, of um, KOH, not, no KCL. And then when you excite, so this is sort of the scheme that you, with the laser, create excited potassium atoms, which give rise to 766 and 769 nanometer. Then when you excite with uh, 193, uh, which is shown here, this is with, with um, KCL and this is with uh, KOH. Uh, but with this information, knowing how much you produce with KOH and KCL, uh, it's possible to estimate the number density, uh, providing we know the temperature, providing we know the trapping, the reabsorption of the potassium atom, and account for the quenching. So it's not that easy, but it's possible to measure both of these species uh, in different uh, biomass combustion. So this is the distribution of, of KOH and KCL with their residence type on the order of 500 um, seconds. So uh, another species in uh, biomass is uh, sulfur dioxide. And uh, once again, we were lacking uh, absorption cross-section. And that could be measured with the um, burner I described before. These are, are um, absorption cross-section from essentially room temperature up to 1950 Kelvin. And uh, then uh, we can also, while exciting at 266, these are the spectra that comes out. And it's also possible to do uh, 2D uh, measurements. And the detection limit roughly on the order of, of uh, uh, ppm levels. So I mentioned about uh, uh, temperature. It, it's of interest to measure temperature. And uh, you can do that with the surface temperature using thermographic phosphors and gas temperature using two-line atomic fluorescence. Now we'll just uh, briefly uh, recapitulate for those of you who are not uh, in the field uh, that you can have surface temperature by using phosphor particles that are positioned on the surface. Um, I don't go into the detail here. It, it's pretty complex processes. But you uh, illuminate these phosphors with a, uh, preferably a UV light and uh, detect that. And then you can sort of, of analyze either the temporal response or the spectral response to get the temperature of the surface. And that can be used in, in, in quite a lot of, of, of uh, industrial and scientific application. And just to illustrate, uh, if you have a laser, a nanosecond laser, 
illuminate the phosphors, then you will have a decay, which is long when the temperature is low. Then when you increase the temperature, you see that the lifetime is getting much smaller. And then you can just use your photomultiplier tube to get the, the decay and then directly convert that after calibration to a surface temperature. And that you can do also in 2D. And then you have, uh, you can work in the spectral mode. So here you can see um, how the spectra, this is wavelength, this is temperature, how the spectra changes from roughly 400 Kelvin up to maybe 1200 Kelvin. Now you can see that, that if you take the ratio between this peak and that peak, that is very temperature sensitive. And then you can just image two images through two, two uh, interference filters, and then you can get a 2D temperature uh, pretty easily. And that has been applied in engines, in gas turbines, in, in uh, actually the, the Swedish fighter yaws while burning. It can be used very applied. Um, and then you use uh, various phosphors. I mean, you can buy them commercially. Uh, so this is how the lifetime changes, and this is how the ratio changes. So you have to choose a phosphor that is as temperature sensitive in the, temp in the interval you want to study. Uh, now we wanted to use this in, in the biomass. And first of all, this was in the, during pyrolysis. We put a small amount of, of uh, phosphorus onto the particle uh, and illuminate. And then we could get sort of, of the, how the temperature changes uh, when this particle went through the pyrolysis. Uh, then we also want to measure the gas temperature uh, when burning uh, bioparticles. And as I said before, uh, the two-line atomic fluorescence is, is a nice technique. So here we, we used uh, two diodes uh, tuned to the fine structure of, um, in this case, iodine, and uh, detect with, with uh, filters onto a CCD detector. So this is uh, different uh, times after the wood pellets were, were ignited. This is uh, before it was introduced. And here you can see at different uh, stages going through the devolatilization and, and uh, oxidation stages. And, and uh, these are show the reproducibility of the curves. And here the numbers here correspond to the different uh, pictures. So this is the gas temperature uh, above the pellet. And then, of course, it would be of interest to do both, both measure the gas temperature at the same time as measuring the surface temperature. The models uh, like this quite a lot. Um, it's uh, sort of a combining what I've described before, uh, where we the, you can see the laser coming in here in the devolatilization stage, and this is in the shores stage, and here is uh, front view and side view where we have the laser, and you can see the surface temperature, and, and then the laser goes just above, and this is the gas temperature with the pellets here at different uh, times, and this is uh, the surface temperature uh, at two different occasions when the oxygen concentration was, uh, was uh, changed. So this sort of, of illustrate that, that you can do a lot of, of uh, measurements. Uh, but once again, for me as a diagnostician, that doesn't say too much. It has to go to, to someone that, that can use this for model validation. And that, that's uh, very important. Uh, then, of course, th this is uh, something, an idea we had. Would it be possible to measure inside a wood, pe wood pellets, not on the surface? What happened if we, we sort of managed to put in some, some uh, thermographic phosphors inside the particle? And since this is very sensitive, we can illuminate and through multiple scattering, you hit the particle and then it will give multiple scattering, will uh, reach the 
task force and sent out a mission. Uh, and it seems to work. I mean, th this, is, uh, this is not published. This is just sort of proof of principle that here is the, the uh, measurements as a function of time. This is the thermocouple outside. Um, but this, I think, open up, and, and this technique has been used in, in um, measurement on and below uh, thermal uh, barrier coating in gas turbines, where you can sort of put phosphors under the, the TBC, and then you uh, measure above. So then you will get the temperature gradient through a thermal barrier coating based on the same idea. So this is uh, just... Uh, the only thing I would say on, on uh, Genève 4 mixing, here we want to measure HCN, uh, and that we have to measure in the infrared. Didn't work. Ah. There we introduced a small wood pallet uh, that burns, and then we measured just a couple of millimeters above. Uh, and could measure the HCN with uh, GNF4 mixing. I will not go into the detail of, of GNF4 mixing. It's a nonlinear technique. Essentially, you cross two beams, uh, creating a, a population grating. And uh, by that, you can sort of, of get the signal from, in this case, HCN. You can see that it, it's got quite a lot of, of, of up to uh, 2,000 ppm. Uh, of HCM. Yeah, then uh, I will sort of uh, finish off a little bit on, on um, some applied work. And, and uh, as I said before, uh, we work very closely with industry. Uh, and that is a great advantage to sort of show not only the industry, but also our sponsors that we are not just having fun playing around at the academy. We really want this to sort of come to the benefit of, of society and for our country. So um, this is, um, we, we were uh, sponsored by Vattenfall, a power producing company. So I wanted to see, uh, would it work to get any diagnostics in, in uh, a burner with sawdust? So we spent quite some time, uh, we have a very good engineer who built a, a device that we can finally get to, to work with sawdust it started up with, with propane. So here you can see the uh, emission for propane of course, at 282. Uh, you can see the OH. And then uh, when we had the, the biopowder fueled, we could get the spectra. Don't ask me what we saw. But at least we get a signal. And, and uh, I'm not quite sure anyone in the world will be able to analyze this. But at least we could show that it's possible to measure in this environment. And this was sort of 20 years ago. So I get now with the new techniques uh, that, that could really be, be possible. Then also with Vattenfall, uh, uh, we made experiments in a full scale, 75 megawatt boiler. And they wanted to see, uh, because they, they injected ammonia to reduce the NOx. And they wanted to see where does the, the ammonia go? Uh, we didn't uh, work with ammonia, but we sort of, of uh, uh, used a water spray. And now you can see we have a, a sheet, one and a half meter, that goes into the furnace. And it was pretty complicated because we, we use two holes in the furnace. This, this is, uh, I think it was eight meters across. So here is the, the um, laser. It was expanded like this. And then in one of the inspection holes, we put a, a boroscope that looked in uh, 90 degrees through this. But still, it was possible to see uh, the spray. And this is single shots, and this is accumulated. And then uh, I don't have that hair, but we also made course experiments to measure the temperature inside this furnace because the temperature is also very important when you inject. Uh, so, I mean, this shows that, that uh, the techniques are not only for fun. It's not only even for, for working with uh, uh, modelers. It really can go out in the real world. Of course, we have uh, 
special challenges in the real world. Uh, I mean, transport of, of the equipment, uh, optical access, uh, all of this, uh, eye safety. Uh, we have been quite a bit uh, working with um, Siemens Energy in, in Finspong. It's um, roughly 500 kilometers from Lund, so we sort of put all the lasers, equipment, and uh, in this case, we had a high-speed Jag laser, tunable dye laser, and a high-speed camera that has to be uh, covered, not to melt away. And uh, the ambition in the gas turbine is to, to investigate fuel flexibility. And I wanted to see uh, how would the flame change when you go from pure uh, natural gas, air, to uh, increase the, the uh, amount of, of uh, hydrogen. So this is chemiluminescence, OH, and this is uh, OH, planarization induced fluorescence. And here it, it's very interesting to work with, with a company like that because they have a lot of very advanced people. Uh, so they, they were sort of, of sitting, waiting for all this uh, data to compare with their models. So they do um, in-house CFD. But still, uh, after some, some discussion, it's possible to publish. Uh, I, I think uh, we cannot publish everything. Uh, but at, at least so we can publish so that the student can, can have this in their thesis. Uh, and I think that that's sort of the mutual confidence that uh, we work together with them. Uh, we can suppress or, or may not include everything, but they let us publish. And I think that that's very important when you work with, with industry. So... Um, Conclusion, of course I, I'm biased in this, but I, I think that, that optical techniques uh, have a future uh, in this area. Uh, of course the laser, but also the non-laser non based uh, technique like, like spontaneous emission. Uh, I mean the techniques has been around uh, uh, since the late 60s uh, and in the early 70s it started. I started my PhD in 1978, and I've sort of seen the progress. I remember I, I told my, my supervisor, 1978, how could we possibly contribute when everything has been done? Uh, now we see that, that uh, the area has increased uh, expansially, exponentially uh, in the world, and I think that that's because of the, the advantages we have with the laser techniques and the optical techniques. Uh, but once again, I mean, you have to be, be honest. You can't just apply for money and do uh, science, which sort of, of uh, is good for your age index. You have to also show that, that this is good for, for the one who pays you. And indirect is the taxpayer. Uh, but still, I mean, uh, you can do a lot of applied work, uh, but it still has to be state of the art. I'm not saying that, that uh, you should go home and, and do a lot of applied work just satisfying company. I mean, it's really to be able to do applied work, but still so that you are recognized by your colleagues around the world. And uh, as I said, uh, uh, we are in, in a time where we really have to look for, for uh, new fuels. I think that, that fossil fuel will, at least not in Sweden, will get the money to do so much fossil fuel combustion. So we have to look into new fuels, uh, ammonia, hydrogen is maybe not new, uh, metals might, might be something, maybe others, bio-based. And uh, you take advantage of, of that you really can sort of get uh, temporary and spatially resolved uh, data. And uh, there are a lot of techniques. Uh, I don't think neither me nor, nor Gaetano will sort of have time to cover all the techniques, but I mean, you should pick the technique that is the best to solve the actual problem and need, irrespectively if, if it's uh, spontaneous emission, if it's uh, Jennifer mixing, if it's uh, Raman or Rayleigh. So, uh, of course, as you understand, I'm not done this uh, by myself. 
with a very nice uh, group with a lot of, of, of skilled person, uh, both in our division, but also the, the uh, extensive collaboration we've had with the Division of Fluid Mechanics, Combustion Engines, Heat Transfer, Fire and Safety Engineering in Lund and also outside Lund. And then there are a lot of, of um, sponsors that has contributed to this. So by that, I thank you for your attention. Thank you very much, really excellent talk. Do we have any questions for Professor Marcus? Yep. Yeah, thank you for the very, very nice presentation. I have one question regarding the LIF measurements. LIF. LIF, yes. Yeah. How accurate do you think the temperatures get if we first have to, if we first have to estimate uh, the quenching? The, Do you uh, have any the accuracy you mean? Exactly, yeah. Compared to other measurements like uh, cars, for example. Well, cars, I mean, that's mainly used for temperature. Uh, but for the, the um, uh, two-line atomic fluorescence, I, I think we claim 2D temperature precision on the order of 4 or 5% in 2D. Uh, but that depends, of course, on, on a lot of... of uh, uh, how the, the situation looked like in, in the lab and, and for the um, concentration measurements, uh, it depends a little bit on when you do the back and forth. I mean, you can't do that. You have to have a sufficient number of, of uh, absorptions. Uh, you can't have too little and you can't have too much. But once you are in the region uh, sort of between maybe 5 and, and, and 30%, I mean, I would say that, that the accuracy is... is uh, Pretty good, uh, meaning five uh, percent or ten percent or something like that. That that's roughly. Okay, thank you. Because that that's of course a, a key issue. I mean, uh, we always have to evaluate the precision and the accuracy. I mean, uh, a data without error bars, uh, which is given to the modelers, that they have to rely on our data. Uh, a lot of work is put into trying to to get all the, the uh, possible errors. Yep. Uh, this question is from a person online. So uh, uh, he says, did you use detailed reaction mechanism or reduced for a simulation of uh, NH3 air uh, in the aluminum planes? Um, well, to be honest, I, I, I was not in, involved in the modeling, but I, I think they used a, a complete, uh, maybe, do you know? Yeah. <laughs> He's a former student uh, working with kinetics. I mean, they, they, they use, um, they have a full, I mean, Conov, Alexander Conov, who used, have a full mechanism. But sometimes, uh, I mean, it's a sort of, of a reduced mechanism, but I'm not quite sure exactly uh, in the example I showed, uh, which was which. Thank you. Uh, there is another question, if no one. Go ahead. Uh, so, for uh, NH PLIF, uh, you introduced two laser wavelengths, uh, uh, 302 and 333 nanometers. What is the consideration for selecting uh, the uh, each each wavelength? Uh, for ammonia combustion? That's for NH. Uh, yeah, yeah. For NH plus. Yeah, I mean, the, the, the uh, one is from, from um, uh, zero to one, and one is from zero to zero. And when you, at 336, I mean, you are on resonance, so you might have problems with the background, which you don't have in the other. But mostly, you don't have that much background. So in mo our cases, we have used uh, 333 or 336, uh, most cases. Any other question in the audience? I have a comment on what you just said at the, at the conclusion. That was really uh, interesting because regularly we have students who come to us and say, okay, I'm doing research in this field, trying to solve this problem, uh, but I want to do PIV and PLIF also. And the question is, okay, why do you want to do PIV and PLIF? Because they see PIV and PLIF in, the, in many papers. 
So they think that they need to do something with that. What's your comment on that? Well, I, I, I think laser use fluorescence is used because it, it, it's very versatile. It, it, I mean, it gives 2D, I mean, 3D, I didn't show 4D. Uh, and uh, at least sometimes it's possible to get the number densities. Uh, um, but you have to work hard to, to get the absolute number densities. And that's why I think uh, to complement uh, with Raman spectroscopy, where you, at least in one point, could get the absolute number density pretty easily. So I would see that it's not a, a competition between the different techniques. In the early days of the Gordon Conference, you sort of, it was a linear and then non-linear team, and they were, I wouldn't say that they were fight, but I mean, for me, it's just to use the technique most suitable for what you want to do. Sometimes one point measurement uh, is sufficient and to get the, the number density. Then, of course, you should do Raman. If you want to have 2D, uh, Raman might be a problem, uh, uh, then you can use LIF. And in some cases, for example, for, for C, uh, HCN, uh, it was not possible to use late induced fluorescence. Um, so to generate for uh, it was not just for fun. I mean, we really want to measure this species. So, uh, but then, of course, there are a lot of techniques which we just do for fun. <laughs> But uh, sooner or later, I think, uh, to be honest, it has to be proven that, that uh, it can be used. Uh, because then, then the, our industrial sponsor might uh, uh, understand that we are honest and we say that we tried. It didn't work uh, in the engine or in the gas turbine. But at least we tried. For example, we did an experiment with uh, filtered Rayleigh scattering. It worked very nice in the lab. And then I sort of forced the PhD to, to uh, the postdoc to do engine measurement. And it was a total failure. Did it work? I don't, still don't know why. But at least we could say to the Volvo, I think it was, that we tried. I mean, we, we thought this was a good idea. It worked in the lab. But for some reason, it didn't work in the engine. And they were happy with that. But I think uh, honesty and, and uh, uh, that they could trust us when we say that we have a technique, we think it will work. Uh, then they might give us money, uh, but we also should be able to fail. Good. Okay, so if there is no more questions, thanks again, Marcus. Thanks.